Welcome to the Endless Knot Podcast. Where the more we know, the more we want to find out. Tracing serendipitous connections through our lives and across disciplines. Hi, I'm Avon. And I'm Mark. And today we're going to be talking about the Odyssey. So we have a very special guest today. Emily Wilson is Professor of Classical Studies at the University of Pennsylvania, where her research interests are listed as including tragedy, poetics, literary theory, reception of classical literature, especially in the Renaissance, and gender. We're talking to her today because of her just-published translation of The Odyssey, which has been released to great acclaim by classicists and general readers alike. This is also the first published translation into English by a woman, which has naturally been the focus of much of the discussion. So welcome, Emily. Thank you for speaking with us today. Thank you so much for having me. Nice to be here. So before we get started, we thought we would ask you if you could read the opening lines of your translation to give us and our listeners a bit of a sense of the style and the choices you've made. Now, I know you've read this many times, but they are very famous opening words. So if you could indulge us. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So I'll just read the first page. Great. Tell me about a complicated man, Muse. Tell me how he wandered and was lost when he had wrecked the holy town of Troy and where he went and who he met, the pain he suffered in the storms at sea and how he worked to save his life and bring his men back home. He failed to keep them safe. Poor fools, they ate the sun god's cattle and the god kept them from home. Now, goddess, child of Zeus, Tell the old story for our modern times. Find the beginning. I'm going to stop there. The first question of where the poem ends is, of course, a much debated one. <laughs> where that first line, yeah, yeah, where, yeah, where the opening ends and the rest begins. Exactly, yes. Well, thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> so I can't help but start with almost the first word, which I know has been brought up again and again because it's such a brilliant translation, which is the complicated man. Sure, yes. And partly because... <laughs> it occurred to me when I was rereading it that the immediate thought that comes to my mind, and I have no idea whether you know this reference at all, is he's a complicated man, no one knows him, but understands him but his woman. Right. I, you know, I, I was not thinking about that until and people started saying it to me. Yeah. And I was, oh, <laughs> I, I had, it was not in my mind whatsoever when I decided I was going to go with that for the beginning. Of course, that's the Shaft theme song for those who, <laughs> who don't <laughs> have that background. Yes, and, and, I, and I had not thought about it. And I think I might well have ruled it out if I'd, if I'd realized. It <laughs> you know what? I, I mean, yes. obviously, it's it's um, uh, an accidental intertext, shall we say. Yes. <laughs> but I've got to say, the more I thought about it, you know, it's that, that... It's, actually, it's not bad. I know. It's, it's, yeah, I might have ruled it out. But in fact, it's, I don't, I don't think it's a terrible intertext at all. I no, mean, it's, it's... It's potentially kind of a useful one. Yeah, it's a yes. movie all about uh, masculinity and... Exactly, yes. And the poem all about masculinity yeah. and... Yes. <laughs> no one understands him but his woman, I mean. <laughs> <laughs> yes. His various goddesses as well, in fact. Yes, him. his women. Yeah. You could just make it a plural, it's <laughs> <Yeah>. fine. Because <laughs> we've got to include the divine. Mm -hmm. um, yes, so I mean, I guess the word complicated, it's... The, the original word is polytropon. Mm -hmm. It's in the case, it's polytropos. It's one of the several epithets of Odysseus. Mm -hmm. Odysseus, unlike other Homeric heroes, um, has multiple epithets, and his epithets tend to suggest multiplicity. Mm -hmm. They all, all start with polu, which means many or multiple. Mm -hmm. Whereas Achilles is, is consistently described as swift footed, um, and Agamemnon is the shepherd of the people, it's not like there are multiple different things that they are. They're those things. Um, whereas Odysseus is multiple and he's many, many types of multiple. Mm -hmm. So the, the, this polytropos is a relatively rare epithet of Odysseus. So I think there's something marked about the fact that the poem uses that in the first line. It's not the most common epithet of Odysseus in the poem. And it seems to me important that in later Greek, the usage of polytropos includes describing situations or circumstances as well as people. Mm. So I wanted to find a word that would not just suggest um, turning, twistedness, potentially, potentially both um, internal and external kinds of turns, um, that it, he's both in complicated situations and he is himself a layered or turning kind of person, a person who can turn and twist the situations that he's in. Mm -hmm. um, but it could also describe the story and the poem as well as the character, because I think that's part of what's, what's being done programmatically in that first line is that it's not just describing the protagonist, it's describing what kind of epic is this? Right. In contrast to the, you know, in contrast to the Iliad, which is a much more sort of straight shooting narrative uh, mode, mm -hmm. this is a 
narrative mode, which just defines itself from the start as being about the narrative mode that it's in and about the, the twistiness of its narrative mode. Mm-hmm. And what I particularly like, I mean, I think all of that is, is brilliant. Isn't it nice that there is a word in English that works so well for it? <laughs> yeah. But I also like that given its etymological roots too, so it's it's many folded, many folds, many yeah. folds for complicated, um, and that's that's a nice. I mean, it's not exactly the same as twisted, not but quite the same metaphor. But it's a very related metaphor. Yeah, yes. yeah, and that one that works well when you're talking about textual layering too. Exactly. Many yes. Folds, yeah. Yes. And I like the fact that it's also a real word. I mean, unlike mm-hmm. some translations, just do a made up word. I mean, do a much turning or much. Mm-hmm man of many turns kind of thing and I don't I, I mean obviously I wanted to to be all to be programmatic myself about the fact that I wanted to create a translation which didn't go in for made up words that it right. was going to be a translation in actual English right um, so yeah so to do all of that in the first line it's pretty good <laughs> it's pretty good I mean there's always compromises and I'm always constantly second and third and fourth guessing but it's it's not bad Yes. <laughs> so before we go further into the sort of uh, meat of the translation, just to set it up, before this, in terms of what translations you had done and, and also what your general work had been on, as far as I can tell, there'd been a lot of work on tragedy in particular. Yes. So my first book, um, my dissertation, which then became my first book, was mm-hmm. about tragedy. And in a way, it's about the, the relationship of tragedy to epic, because it's about tracing Milton's um, tragic roots. So I was, I was always interested in epic as well as tragedy and about the relationship of those two genres. Mm-hmm. Yes. And, and I've also done some translations of Euripides. And yes, I, I'm, I continue to be interested in tragedy. I'm also editing a volume of essays on ancient tragedy right now. And I've also done some translations of Seneca's tragedies too. So why specifically the Odyssey? I, you, you mentioned in your uh, opening that the Odyssey has always been, it was your entry into classics in many ways. Yes, exactly. So, so when I was eight, I was in a elementary school production of the Odyssey and I got to play the goddess Athena, which was, you know, super exciting for the eight-year-old me. And that was part of what made me draw, be drawn to the Greek myths in the first place. And I mean, obviously then it, it, it doesn't necessarily predetermine that every eight-year-old who likes Greek myths doesn't necessarily become a classicist, but in my case, it did. It did, it did. I'm I trying to it. imagine uh, our kids' school doing a school production of the Odyssey, and, and my mind is boggling a little. At it. I know. I, I can't imagine my kids' schools like that for sure. They, they're not. Doing, they're not going to do it. I know. They were super creative, and it was just a. I mean, I grew up in Oxford, England. It was just a sort of absolutely bog standard um, right. a Church of England primary school. It wasn't a fancy private school. It was. They were just very, very <laughs> creative teachers who had enormous yeah. amounts of initiative. Thank you to those teachers. They were great. Our kids are doing their Christmas concert on Thursday and and there's (laughs) there's nothing so narratively complicated. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, but that's yes. (laughs) So is that why the Odyssey and not the Iliad, for instance? No. So Norton asked me to do the Odyssey. They were looking first for an Odyssey and and I think from their perspective, one of the reasons is just that the Odyssey is taught um, in its entirety more often in the United States than the Iliad in its entirety. Um, partly because it, it feeds so well into not just Western canon kind of classes or literature 101, yes, but yes. world literature. I mean, because it, it opens up into all these different responses. Walcott's Amoros is obviously is obviously just one of the many sort of non-Western or you know, less European responses to the Odyssey. And it's a poem that is sort of engaged with the whole world and what is the whole world? What is it to encounter people who are not like you, not just in terms of gender or social class, but also foreigners and pe- people whose cultures are completely different. So, I mean, it was, I think if they'd asked me to do the Iliad, you know, I love the Iliad too. It's not like I have something against the Iliad and I suspect right. I will do the Iliad one day. But for now, the Odyssey was the one they wanted first. Well, that makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> do what somebody will publish is a good first step. <laughs> exactly, yes. And uh, don't spend five years laboring over something that nobody wants. <laughs> I agree about the utility of the Odyssey from a, a teaching perspective, for sure. Um, and it's it, it also yes. feels sometimes, I think, easier for students, even if it isn't an easier text necessarily, it seems more uh, engaging on the surface. Exactly. I mean, I think it, even my wonderful creative teachers would not have put on the Iliad. No. Who would have played Aphrodite? That's what I want to know. 
<laughs> wounded by Diomedes and running to her daddy. It would have been a perfect primary school play. I don't know what the problem is. <laughs> yes. So I guess the other preliminary choice you, you had to make was uh, about the meter. Yes, absolutely. Yes. And, and you chose, you know, the meter of Paradise Lost. You know, it's a very, very standard meter for epic in English. So it's a, yes. it's, it's a good connection there. Though I wonder if you would also at any point considered rhyming couplets, which is often referred to as <laughs> heroic verse in, in English. Yes, I mean, I, I I didn't seriously consider rhyming couplets. I mean, I love both the Chapman translation and the Pope translation, both of which, of mm -hmm. course, are in rhyming couplets. Mm -hmm. um, I just think for a contemporary poem and contemporary readership, um, rhyming couplets would, I just don't think that they would add anything. I think they would add enormously to my labor, and mm -hmm. I don't. I think they would actually detract from the reader's experience because right. they, they create all this end-stopping every two lines. Um, in a way that I think would actually feel gimmicky. I mean, I, obviously, in, in in the period of either Pope or Chapman, it didn't feel gimmicky. It felt like this is the normal way to do mm -hmm. an elevated verse form. But in, in our era, I do think it would seem just like I'm showing off rather than like I'm taking you on a an interesting literary adventure. Right. Um, so, I mean, I definitely wanted it to be markedly verse. And, I, and one of the reasons that I signed up for the project in the first place is that I don't like the fact that um, the dominant mode in translations, not just of the Odyssey, but of classical verse in general, is to do non-metrical verse. Right. Um, I, I really wanted to do something which has a very, very clear rhythm to it, and that it is metrical, and it is acknowledging its debt to Milton, Shakespeare, the long line of Anglophone narrative and dramatic poetry that, of course, I, I'm, I'm kind of immersed in, and I want to, to show that Homer can can be read not just by leapfrogging back to the 8th century, but by um, creating a conversation with the literary tradition that, that the literary traditions that we may be in as well. Um, but I, I, I didn't want to do couplets um, for the reasons I've suggested. I didn't want to do hexameters either, which would be another, I think, gimmicky way to do it. Right. Um, just because I, just, I don't think that hexameters have ever been done successfully in a, in a long form poem in English, mm -hmm. and it just would involve too much distortion of the native tr traditions of the language. Yeah, yeah, I, I read a an Aeneid translation in hexameters um, yes. not that long ago, and yeah. I'm I'm I wasn't convinced by it. I mean, it was an impressive feat, but I yes, there's one by Rodney Merrill of the Odyssey into hexameters, yeah. and again, it's impressive. I do think it comes across as gimmicky. I don't think it works. Yeah, um, and it's heavy. It, it just it yeah, it's hard to read. Heavy. You keep not yes. being quite sure where your where the units are i think is exactly yes and, and it also just in terms of the costs you have to pay to make make the rhythm work you have to make every single word choice you make more or less is determined by this very very rigid and unnatural mm -hmm. rhythmical mm -hmm. pattern. yeah and i just think the possibility of blank verse is that it's quite possible to make it sound very very natural at the same time as making it completely magical yeah and I just don't think that's possible if, if I had gone with hexameters. Mm -hmm. The other thing that I was quite intrigued by, and, and I think this is, is a really good way of looking at it, in, in the translator's note at the beginning of the book, you talk about the metaphor of the faithful translation and how yes. that's particularly apt when translating this particular work. Yes, <laughs> uh, apt or in, inapt. I mean, it's, it's, it's kind of both. Like, Relevant, it's, shall it's, we say. It's, yeah. it's, a, it's a whole problematics in this, in this poem, mm -hmm. yes. Yes. So the whole question of what, what does it mean to be faithful uh, or what does it mean to be responsible and is fidelity the right term? Yeah. I think that's sort of at stake in the Odyssey. Of, mm -hmm. you know, obviously what fidelity means for Penelope or for Helen is different from what it means for Odysseus. Mm -hmm. The poem doesn't, doesn't define it that we should judge Odysseus adversely for having spent seven years with Calypso or a year with, with Circe because mm -hmm. you know, that, that, that's, not, that's not defined as having somehow made him a traitor no, to his no. marriage. That, whereas, that isn't the criterion of his fidelity. It's not the criterion of his fidelity, whereas, of course, it's the criterion of Penelope's fidelity. Mm -hmm. that if she were to move the marriage bed, mm -hmm. that would be terrible. And it would be something that Odysseus is you know, absolutely furious about, even the possibility that that could happen, and mm -hmm. even the possibility that she could mar marry one of the suitors or have, have either one of these suitors move into the house or go away with them. That would be terrible. Mm -hmm. So this whole question of how, how fidelity is gendered within the poem itself, I think also then bleeds into how do we judge translators about 
their fidelity to this you know masculine masculine and androcentric original mm-hmm. um, and it just seems to me that it's actually interesting to think about the way the poem sets up these um these layers of double standards or triple standards about fidelity because it's also there were different standards for the divine world as opposed to the human world as well mm-hmm. um and, and then, i think that actually is an invitation to try to move beyond that metaphor and to try to think in terms of responsibility or truthfulness mm-hmm. and not quite so much in terms of fidelity because if we think in terms of fidelity we may well be thinking it's it's like penelope there's only one way to be faithful mm-hmm. as opposed to it's like odysseus and there are many ways to be um to get back to ithaca getting back to ithaca is this long process and it involves multiple different relationships multiple different decisions a whole complicated <laughs> um multi-layered plan and I think actually the translator's task, both about the Odyssey and in general, is, involves much more a, pla- a set a sequence of strategic planning that's more like that. That it's a it's about a loyalty to a particular but multi layered kind of goal and, and multi layered relationships. Mm-hmm. And that it, the translator also has to be in a way like Odysseus and constantly in disguise. But then there are questions about what is the true self, right? Mm-hmm. What is the, the actual the actual odyssey or the actual words by me. And it's always both. It's always by Homer and by me at the same time. Right. And, you know, the thing that this this all sort of reminds me of, if you'll forgive a, a, a slight digression into uh, the Middle Ages. Sure. Since I, I work on... I thought you might get that, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I work on, on medieval vernacular translations of Latin. And King Alfred, when translating from Latin, he described his pros as huilum word be worda, huilum Anyit of anyita, so sometimes word by word, sometimes idea from idea, and it, mm-hmm. it's this. this yeah. You have to be true to the idea of the text, not just the literal, you know, word by word translation. Exactly. So I mean, I guess that's all coming also just from the Roman Latin tradition of discussions of translation, mm-hmm. right? I mean, there, there are various passages in Cicero about the, about whether one should translate sensum sensu mm-hmm. or ver, 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 yeah. right? Yeah. And that that whole question of then what what does it mean to translate sense by sense, and also what does it mean to translate word by word? I mean, it's not like I can just transliterate the Greek and have produced a translation, then I would just have written the Greek out. Yes. Right. You know, the notion that, that word by word translation is possible is actually kind of muddled. Mm. I mean, I don't think it is possible. I think no. there are ways that you can choose to be either more foreignizing or clunkier or choose not to be as clunky. Mm. But each of those things is a different way of thinking about what is the sense, right? I mean, if you mm. think the sense is the word order, then you might want to echo the word order more. Um, if you think the word, the sense includes the form or the alliteration or you know all these things that it could include, mm-hmm. and you're inevitably going to be making choices. So I think the the idea that there is such a thing as the literal translation is a kind of imaginative construct. It's a fiction. Yeah, and of course, I mean, you know, what's going on here beyond the translation of the language is also the trans the cultural translation that's going on. For sure, the Odyssey at times it seems very contemporary um, with basic human emotions. And at times it seems very alien. Mm -hmm. Um, So one has to be aware of how the audience is going to perceive the text at any one moment. Yes, exactly. And I think, I mean, I've heard people try to defend the idea that an an Odyssey translation or a translation of Homer ought to be archaizing in certain ways, Mm -hmm. because of course the language of Homer in the original is weird. Mm-hmm. And some of the words in Homer are would have been, you know, archaic or odd or in a strange dialect to readers of, say, the fifth or fourth century BC. Mm-hmm. Um, and because, of course, many of the words in Homer are centuries older than extant usage in um, the fifth century. Um, and it just seems to me that, I mean, of course, it is possible to do an archa- archaizing translation, but just the idea that. That's the experience we have to reconstruct, as opposed to the experience of a listener in the eighth century BC, when fewer of the words would be archaic. Mm. Seems to me it's debatable. Like, whose experience are we trying to evoke by um, translating the Odyssey, either with um, a clearer and more contemporary discourse or a more archaizing discourse? And it's not preset ahead of time that one of those experiences is more authentic than the other. Mm. Yeah, a, a text that has such a long life, even within its own original context, whatever mm-hmm. we call that, to yes. to pick any moment and say, 
this is the moment, as you say, that you're recreating um, is is a choice. Yes, it, it's arbitrary. It, yeah, and, and one has to do that to some degree. Or you can just say, I don't care what I'm recreating. I'm I want to make this an experience that is uh, appropriate for how we're going to read it and meaningful. I mean, mm-hmm. one has to not just make it. Um, to reconstruct some kind of artifice that's in a museum, but also make people want to read it. Mm-hmm. I mean, otherwise, there's no point. Right? Um, <laughs> yeah, an art piece it could be, but that yeah, yeah. <laughs> I won't get it very yes. far. I mean, so, for instance, there's a 19th century translation by Francis Newman, which makes this. Um, I mean, we've talked about the, the virtuosic metrical experiments, mm-hmm. but the Newman mm-hmm. translation makes the virtuosic lexical experiment of including multiple different dialects of English oh, into oh. his translation, right. which is I call it, again, it's a great modernist experiment yeah. um and of course it's completely un- unreadable uh, as you would expect <laughs> <laughs> you wouldn't do that thinking i'm going to make it accessible to everyone no, no. um <laughs> and and it's fantastic but it's all it, it is it certainly isn't isn't a, a reading experience that you can get immersed in or care about the characters right and i actually think with the original i mean when i'm reading the greek i care about the characters mm-hmm. and i care about the narrative impetus and I want that to be essential to the narrative experience of my translation. Um, I just think that in order to, to get that, you then have to give up on, I'm going to show off about how many dialects of English I know. Right. Um. <laughs> and so, of course, you, you therefore made the choice of using contemporary English, that the, the yes. English that people you know speak and know, though not in necessarily informal language. So how do you strike yes. that balance? That's a difficult balance as well. I mean, I, I felt that I was, in terms of revising my multiple drafts, I was constantly trying to, you know, not teeter-totter off the bar of, I don't want it to be too slangy. I don't want it to be too much a sort of low register. Mm-hmm. One thing I did to try to make sure it's not absolutely identical with, um, you know, too much um, language of the street is that I didn't, I avoided contractions entirely. I, I didn't use didn't at right, all. Right, right. Which I think combined with the meter, um, which again is very, very regular meter, I think it keeps it at a register which is just a little bit different from normal speech, mm-hmm. even though I also avoided using too many fancy words. I mean, I wanted it to be very accessible, very clear, but without being too much, um, this is just chatting and it doesn't have any sense of this is um, an, an, an artificial language. I mean, I think it gives mm-hmm. it just a tiny notch of artifice if you avoid contractions and if you use a very regular meter, but not too much artifice. But it's a very difficult balance, for sure. And I also wanted it to be the case that, you know, most of the time, I hope you can feel immersed in the world, you can feel immersed in the characters, um, you can feel you're relating to the story, and then every so often, something's weird. Mm. And I want there to be that moments of, actually, whoa, this is not my my world whatsoever. This is the world of 3,000 years ago. And they see the ocean as purple. And what are they doing on the beach? They're chopping up a hundred cows and they're going to eat the entrails. Yeah. <laughs> and there were these, <laughs> this is both culturally and even just in terms of how things are described. Sometimes it's going to be magical. Sometimes it's going to be very strange. Mm-hmm. But quite a lot of the time it's going to be, I mean, I want it to be very, very human, but also at least occasionally very strange. Yeah. But it's, it's it's more or less impossible to get to feel that that balance has always been completely perfectly, um, you know, that they've, they've always kept that balance. But uh, that's the kind of balance I wanted to keep. But I wanted to also, you know, sometimes it's going to be very strange, very magical, very weird, very, um, sometimes it's going to be very clear and almost normal. Mm-hmm. Um, and then sometimes I'm going to also try to, I, I have these moments of trying to surprise the reader by making it, Markedly contemporary. I mean, the, right. the, the, that I have moments of using the occasional more colloquial word or more markedly modern word. And I, I want to sort of invite people to be thinking, so how close or how distant is this world from my world? Right. That I want there to be a sense of it, it goes in and out of focus about that, which is partly evoked language as well as mm-hmm. the other things that, that, that cause that. Well, which makes sense for Homer as, I mean, going back to what you were talking about, about when people would want to archaize because Homer was archaic, except that it's not uniformly archaic. That's what? that's the thing. Exactly. It's, it's a yes. complete mixture of archaic and contemporary yeah. and mon- and everything in between. And so to translate it into one uniform style is actually less faithful, to yes. use that metaphor, to, to <laughs> yes. the conditions of its 
creation and of its performance yeah. and of its reception. Exactly. exactly. I mean, as I said, I, I didn't want to go crazy with that. No. The, with the idea of the linguistic hodgepodge in the way that, as I say, Francis Newman <laughs> does right. go all out with that. But I wanted to have little touches of that. Mm-hmm. I mean, little touches of this word, this word seems to come from a slightly different register from where I thought we were. Mm-hmm. And just like a little dash of that. Yes. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, it, it, to a different degree, perhaps, but we see that in Shakespeare, for instance, where we have Absolutely. lots yes. of of that yeah. of that change of register mm-hmm. and more dramatic, perhaps, than uh, we'd be comfortable with in what we think of as a unitary book than we are with a play. But still, yes. that idea that you can mark those changes and they can be encompassed within the same basic genre. I don't think that's a, a dif- too difficult for a, an audience to handle. No, I think an audience can totally handle that. Mm-hmm. And I mean, the, one of my favorite examples of that is the moment in Macbeth where um, Macbeth, Macbeth is talking about his about how the blood blood on his hands will never go, and and that, that if, even if you were to have the whole of the ocean, mm-hmm. it would, the multitude would the multitudinous seas incarnadine, mm-hmm. which is so Latinate, and then making the green one red. Yeah, that he sort of switches between it's both. It could happen in Latin and it could happen in English. Mm-hmm. That shows you the whole the whole world of. Of the, of the pollution. Mm-hmm. On that choice of contemporary, I will say um, I wanted to ask you about the choice of uh, varying your translations of the epithets, and I think I, yes. I see how what you, what you've already said about uh, your choices, I think, kind of explains that. But so you've chosen to at least some of the time use different translations for the same epithets. I do. Um, I think in so far as I could, I pretty much always vary, mm-hmm. I and mean, I don't. Think, repeat myself. I mean, now of course somebody will be listening to this and say, "Yeah." On page two hundred (laughs) twenty-three. Yes, but I tried not to because I think um, epithets in a you know still quasi-oral culture Mm -hmm. have a completely different function from the uh, from the function of of describing words, whatever we're going to call Mm -hmm. them. Because I think we shouldn't necessarily call them epithets in a totally literate culture, totally literary text. Mm I, I didn't want to be fraudulent about setting up an idea that um, you're going to be pretending that you're in the 8th century right now. Um, right. I wanted to, have an, to be inviting the reader to think about each word in the translation rather than you can skip because you already read that part about Rosy Fingered Dawn. Mm. Um, so I wanted also to make sure that, um, that each of the formulae and each of the metaphors were not dead metaphors or dead formulae. Mm. And I think that the danger in repeating too much in our literary and and cultural context is that it will just feel like the dead weight cliche i'm going to skip that it doesn't mean anything right and i wanted each element of the text to mean something and i felt that the, way, the only way to do that was to actually think about the epithets and think about the um huge range of different things that could be implied by polymechanos or polyclass or mm-hmm. polytropos and then bring out something slightly different within that range on each occasion. Mm-hmm. So on, in some ways, it, it allows you to avoid the translator's dilemma of there are 85 things this word could mean, and I can only choose one. You actually get to <laughs> yes. choose each of the 85. I get to choose, <laughs> yes, not, not necessarily 85, no, but, but, but you know, in the case of Dawn, I get to choose you know, 18 different things. Yeah, yes. Yeah. Um, different. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> um, it, yes. I, I bring that up because I, t- I do under- I, I understand that and I from a readability or a comprehensibility or sort of you know attractiveness to the reader point of view it, I, I think you're quite right. We have a tendency to um, to us repetition means unimportant as yes. opposed to the repetition being actually a, a marker of importance as it is within an oral yes. culture it becomes a marker of unimportance to us. Exactly, yes. So if you're trying to translate the sense by sense, mm-hmm. and what is the function of this epithet? The function may be to say, this dawn is important. Mm-hmm. And everybody pay attention now. Out. Yeah, yeah. Yes, pay attention. Be, keep on reading hard. Mm-hmm. Yes. And I, I think the, the formulaicness of the poem still gets across. I and mean, it's not that I think, I, I, and I didn't want to erase the, the, the element of the reading experience where you're aware things happen in particular ways, and they happen over and over, sort of the same way, but with variations. I mean, the formula formula type scene, every time somebody gets dressed, every time yeah, yeah. they eat a meal, you know, these elements are going to be there. And I think there's, even even though I don't make it as repetitive as I could have done, 
I think you still get that. Yeah, there's a more of a that. structural. You see the the repetition and the formula in the structure rather than in the linguistic elements. Yes. Yeah. From a teaching point of view, I'm glad to have a text that my students will read. <laughs> so that's yeah, obviously <laughs> that's the crucial bit. If they won't read it, it doesn't matter what else it does. <laughs> I always regret it slightly just because, you know, we spend our time talking about formulaic composition and then you turn to the text and you're like, and these are all repeated. Trust me. <laughs> but, you know, that's fine. I can teach around that. <laughs> I know. I mean, the thing is also that you can't do, you can't teach close reading in the same way with a translation. No, and I think you always have to make that, 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 that shift yeah. anyhow. Yeah. And then it gives you the chance to yes. talk about translation, talk about the function of epithet. So it's, it, you, one can always find a yes. way of teaching with the text. That's not a problem. Yes. <laughs> yes. And speaking about teaching, I imagine, I mean, obviously, when you think about your audience, you're not only thinking about the classroom, you're also thinking about general readership. But as you pointed out, this is a core text in so many classrooms, particularly in the US, I guess, but also here in Canada. Yeah. So what are your thoughts about using this translation as a teaching text? What do you think about when you think about the audience and when you try to balance the sort of readability and teachability and so forth? I guess I, I wanted to, I mean... Just in terms of what I think my students have needed in reading the Odyssey in translation, I wanted to to both have um, readability, but also to have a have a lot of sense of narrative and ethical complexity. Mm. And I and in, in teaching the, this poem in translation, I've const I've repeatedly felt frustrated by the fact that I think many of the translations that are out there tend towards oversimplifying in term not not in terms of language choice. I mean, sometimes there's a, sometimes there's archaizing, sometimes there's foreignizing, but having difficult language isn't the same as having difficult narrative or difficult ethics. Mm -hmm. And I think that what I want from, from, from a translation of this, one, one of the things I wanted, even beyond the poetic and literary goals that I wanted, is to have a sense that the, the students should know this is a complex um, world that's being evoked is a complex um, storytelling mode. The characters are rounded and difficult and it's not a story with good guys and bad guys. Mm -hmm. And I, I've noticed, for instance, I mean, I've fairly frequently taught um, just sort of the, the middle section of the Odyssey with um, Odysseus's wanderings mm -hmm. and the encounter with the Cyclops. And so on several different occasions, I've had the experience of the students come in with this notion that it's really clear that Odysseus is the good guy and he tricks the bad monster who eats people and yay for Odysseus. Mm -hmm. And I just think that that's a very limited way of reading what's happening in that book. And it's it's not that, you know, the Cyclops who eats the people, is he a good guy? No, those are the wrong terms. And the narrative is much more complicated than that, much more layered. Um, the fact that we're told at the start of book nine, what Odysseus first does is go to the island of the Sicones and mm -hmm. slaughter all the people and enslave all the women and take all the stuff. That there's this, and we're also told that this is the this is the start of Odysseus's own narrative. It's all through the point of view of this um, potentially very unreliable narrator who's constantly saying um, both the the Cyclops and the Cyclopic people are lawless but then he also shows us all the norms and regularity of his routine we're told that they're godless and then we're shown him praying to poseidon the god i mean there's all this narrative tension mm -hmm. and i think that the translation so many of the translations that i've looked at try to in so far as it's possible to damp down that narrative tension and i just wanted not to do that um i mean just to be, to be honest about the ways that this narrative is pointing in multiple different directions which I think is really important in terms of inviting a fruitful discussion for the students. Mm -hmm. All of that is there in the text originally. I agree per completely. And also uh, it, it makes the, I mean, the reason, one of the reasons the Odyssey is taught so much, I think, not only all the reasons you gave already, but because it, it allows us to sort of say, hey, metatextuality, for lack of a more yes. less ac anachronistic word, is there from the beginning. We have, you know, right. the, the inter- woven narratives and the, as you say, the unreliable narrator and the multiple perspectives and the, you know, all of that is, is there baked into our literary tradition from the time we have a Absolutely, literary tradition. Yes. And, and while yes. you can get that out of the Iliad too, there is that in the Iliad. It is so much. There is that, but it's less obvious. The, the, yeah. the, ins the number and the complexity of insert narratives. I mean, obviously in 
how about my mimesis, the way that he deals with the um, the inset narrative about Odysseus' scar, mm-hmm. one can argue with Auerbach about whether he reads that that inset narrative, you know, about about his particular way of reading that inset narrative. Mm-hmm. But the fact he he notices when we're thinking about you know the history of representation, yes, um, we have to start with thinking about how does the Odyssey focalize um, representation? Mm-hmm. How is how is representation happening? Um, not just through I'm going to tell you a, a story and it's going to be linear. It's not linear. No. And it does go through multiple different characters' perspectives and those perspectives are radically different from each other. Mm-hmm. And in fact, though it's rarely read in this order, to read the Odyssey before reading the Iliad equips you to read the Iliad for its metatextuality much better than you do if you come to it first, I think. I think so too, yes. I mean, even just thinking about the shield of Achilles mm-hmm. and just thinking about the ways that there are all these very interesting and important inset narratives in the Iliad, yeah. which I think one can be blind to if one's thinking too much in terms of it's just about going forward in time and then the anger's over and it's done. Mm-hmm. Or you, know, you take um, the moments with Helen and her weaving or all, uh, you know, all of the Andromache yes. telling her stories of her past. Yes. And, you know, so much of that stuff. I think you're more keyed to that if you've read the Odyssey and thought about it first. But I mean, I also understand why one tends to read them in the other order. Minor details yes. like <laughs> chronological narrative. But it maybe maybe that's exactly why yes. we shouldn't read them in that order. <laughs> We should yes. Start. Oh, you inspire me. Next time I teach them, I'm gonna. <laughs> yeah, that's them. it. We're reading the Odyssey first, people, and then we're gonna find out about the backstory. <laughs> uh-huh. Yeah, it's funny. Mark has well. We've both taught some uh, ancient world and film courses recently, and there are a couple of readings of the Odyssey. You know, a couple of versions of the Odyssey in mini series and in in movies. And uh, we were both noticing that it's interesting that they almost all flatten that narrative complexity. Yeah. yeah. Almost completely. Yes. Or put a little bit of yes. it in, but you know, they there are some flashbacks and a bit, but mostly they just they're like, This is too complicated. We're just we're unpicking this all yes. and we're taking out the Telemachus narrative and we're <laughs> The one exception to that is the yes. Kirk Douglas Ulysses, yeah. which does maintain that. Oh yeah, I I only recently saw that. Yes, it, it's weird, right? That it has this whole sense of is he suffering from memory loss mm-hmm. and yeah. what exactly is going on in his mind. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It, it, it comes closer to, to representing something or other about narrative complexity in the original. I mean, it doesn't go all the way there, for sure. No, so it sort of shows you how um, there can be a tendency to think teleologically about progression of narrative complexity and, and literary complexity over time. And, you know, the simplicity of a, a oral composition to the complexity of postmodernism. And yet our yes. more modern narrative styles are just not up to the task of handling the narrative complexity of of this yes. poem. So well, at least they haven't been. Yet. They haven't I mean, been. Surely, we're not up. They, they are not as up. often done that well that way. Yeah. They yet. Yes. Yes. Of yes. course, there are movies out there with extremely complicated yes. narratives. Yeah, yeah. But, <laughs> there are. but but if we're if we're comparing, let's say, popular popular storytelling as the Odyssey was to popular cinematography, I would say that they are, mm-hmm. are not. Uh, I, I mean, it seems to me that like you know. We're, if we're in the golden age of television, it's because of the narrative complexity of yes. TV mm-hmm. since the wire. Yes. Right? No, I agree it, with that. Yeah. It, it ought to be possible to create a, a version of the Odyssey that's more truthful to that narrative complexity now than it was twenty years ago. Yes. Yes. I think well, I think that's true. It hasn't I, done yet. Yeah. I think we're Eventually, more ripe for it now. Yes. One little point about something I know that you've you've brought out clearly, and it just it matches with my personal pet peeves. So. <laughs> <laughs> is uh, your <laughs> insistence, as it were, on translating slave as slave and not servant. Oh, yes, that's super important. Yes, yes. absolutely. I, I, mean, I was shocked. I, mean, I hadn't realized until, you know, until I was quite far on and doing my translation, because you know, mostly I was just working with the Greek. I wasn't looking at lots of other translations. Mm-hmm. Like, and, and then recently, since I've had to talk much more about my translation and how it's different, I've been shocked to realize how much slavery is erased mm-hmm. in these other popular translations. I mean, how consistent it is that people who are absolutely explicitly slaves Mm -hmm. are represented as housekeepers Mm or herders or Mm -hmm. stewards or, you know, all these words which suggest freedom and they're clearly not free at all. And this is, I think this goes with the simplifying mode. I mean, the, the idea that we want this narrative to be primitive and we don't want to be discomforted by it. We don't want to be made uncomfortable. As soon as you use the word slave, everyone is uncomfortable. Mm-hmm. And I think that's actually important. We need to be uncomfortable in that particular way. Mm-hmm. It's not 
not a skippable kind of discomfort. Yeah, and it comes also out of um, the conventionalization of the translations of particular words yes. that, you, because the other thing about it is housekeeper or maid servant or whatever, those are archaic terms now. So it's not even like they're more contemporarily relevant. They are not words we use. Relevant, <laughs> we don't no. have those people no. in our lives. <laughs> I wish I had a housekeeper, but I don't. Yes, no, it's, well, it's indeed. <laughs> um, yes. No, it, it, I agree entirely. It's one of my, uh, I was, I whenever I teach, well, I teach Latin every year. And uh, as I was saying to my class again this year, my intro class, I said, I'm very, uh, you know, you go ahead and use derivatives in translation. That's fine. Use cognates. I don't care, whatever works. I said, but there's one that I, I, w I will correct you on every time. And that's servant for service. I, I can't handle it. It's slave. It's not servant. I understand why you say it, but it's not. Because our textbook gives, you know, slave comma servant as a translation for service. Yeah. And not okay. It's yes. just not, not correct. Okay. <laughs> no, it's wrong. It's absolutely wrong. Yes, absolutely. I agree entirely that it needs to be, you know, Eumaeus getting portrayed as a faithful retainer as he so it's often terrible. is. Yes. I know. No, he's, and especially when it's, it's not only just, you know, there in the text, but also he tells the narrative very clearly about how he was kidnapped and enslaved. <laughs> about how he was kidnapped as a, as a little boy and trafficked and enslaved. And it's, a, it's such a powerful moment in the poem. That, and it seems astonishing that people don't take that narrative seriously enough to recognize this is... Mm -hmm. This is what the poem is explicitly telling us. Mm -hmm. It's about a history of slavery from the, from this character's point of view. And of course, the character himself, I mean, one can struggle with how much is the, is the narrative presenting. You know, this is the ideal kind of slave from the mm -hmm. owner's point of view. It's the one who's so, um, so traumatized by this early life experience that he ends up um, ident identifying all his own interests or subordinating his own identity to the interests of his owner. Mm -hmm. And you know, we, we can do whatever kinds of analysis we want on that. I mean, either cultural, historical, psychological, you know, I think it's all there mm -hmm. and available to be you know, discussed in whatever ways people want to discuss it. But just to erase the fact that that's there is just this enormous gap. Mm -hmm. And I think it affects not just how students read the poem, but also even how scholars read the poem. I mean, mm -hmm. I, I'm sort of shocked in looking at the scholarship on the hanging of the slaves in Book 22 that you, know, you read these titles of articles that say the killing of the maids mm -hmm. mm. and they then go on for 20 pages which, sometimes with a lot of insight about how is this, this um, scene represented. But that if you set it up ahead of time, it's going to be about the maids. There's this enormous distortion that's happening because mm -hmm. that's they're not maids, and Eumaeus is not a an old servant, and mm -hmm. Euryclea is not an old servant. Mm -hmm. Yes, not to mention the have... the complexities of it. Also erases, in a sense, um, you know, five hundred or more years of the complexity of the serving class and the servant class in mm -hmm. English yes, literature. True. You know, which is not yes, by any yes. means uh, an unproblematic issue itself. But to to conflate them doesn't help right. either discussion no, it doesn't help either one and and both to idealize and to simplify either of those mm -hmm. quite separate traditions yes that you know brings us to i think in the discussions that i've seen you having with people about what you know ways your translation is different one of the elements is sort of themes and you've already touched on this to a large extent um themes that your translation highlights in ways that other translations have not and so already we've talked about i suppose it comes across as highlighting but only because of the obscurity of the past but highlighting the positions that of slaves and clarifying the moral complexities of much of Odysseus's own storytelling. Are there other well, themes that you sort of became aware of as once you'd written or done your translation that you realized that were coming out in ways you haven't seen in other translations? I, just before I get to that, I'm just thinking about, I mean, I, I remember there was that NPR review that was about scraping off the barnacles. Mm -hmm. And I think people have talked about getting rid of the, the gilding on this on the statue and in a way these are the wrong metaphors because um i mean not that i have anything against you know the, the people who are using them but just it's not that i'm sort of taking a translation and then mm -hmm. stripping away its grandeur. i'm taking the original and trying to draw out what i see in it yes which you know maybe is different and i'm not importing particular things i'm importing different things perhaps but i'm not importing those particular things mm -hmm. Um, so I'm not sure if it's about stripping away. It's just I'm showing or I'm drawing yes, out. I'm, I'm, I'm drawing out mm -hmm. or highlighting maybe. Yes. Um, I guess I, so. 
we can we haven't talked very much about gender. Mm-hmm. I mean, I guess one thing I'm just thinking about the um, in book five, the representation of Calypso. Right. Um, I, only, I only recently looked at um, other. I looked at the Fagels and I think the Lombardo translations of of the passage where it, where we get the account of Calypso and Odysseus leaving Calypso mm-hmm. and. It's striking to me that other translations um, very much rep- they, they they use the word nymph a lot yes. to translate the Greek, which is a cognate word. But again, I think it's the same problem as you get with Cerus being translated as servant. It doesn't mean nymph. Nymph in English suggests um, a, a female whose sexuality, right? Mm-hmm. And it suggests you're going to be wearing a floaty see-through dress. It's going to be absurd. Um, and then it's a, it's a way of othering her. Whereas I think the original is not... Um, presenting Calypso as absurd. It's presenting her as oh, no. dignified and frightening and divine. And I think there's a real distortion in the ways that the, the other translations I've looked at present Calypso and other her in ways that I don't think the Greek does at all. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, I, I hadn't realized, you know, until quite recently, because I hadn't looked at these other translations in that way until quite recently. But I think that, that my translation does less distortion in terms of um, can we empathize with both Calypso and Odysseus when Odysseus is leaving her? Mm-hmm. And I think we totally can in Greek, and I think we can in mine, but I don't think we can in the other translations I've looked at. Yeah, because Calypso is presented not in any way as a, I mean, a nymph in English also removes, I think, the nymph that has been the person who's been described out of societal structures completely too. And while Calypso is isolated, it's made very clear that she's not completely you know, she knows the gods. She treats them appropriately. Yes. When Hermes uh, arrives, you know, with a with proper hospitality, yes. she functions as a social person. Whereas nymph, in our imaginings now in English, is of a wild thing that has no connection to yes to to society. Exactly. Yes, that's your point. It's somebody who skips about on the on the mm-hmm. hillside. Mm-hmm. Well, it's, it's very interesting that you know, in a poem which is so much engaged with hospitality. Usually, hospitality is something which exists between men. Mm-hmm. But, but then Calypso, because she's divine and therefore is able to have a kind of you know, high level functioning of a kind that most women, even elite women, don't have, mm-hmm. she's able to, to be the host and to, be, to provide the appropriate food. That, that when a divine guest comes, she can offer ambrosia. Then, when it's immortal, she can offer the correct mortal kind of food. Mm-hmm. And the narrative is very careful about showing she's tactful about all these things mm-hmm. and she's able to modulate her hospitality as well as her discourse, depending on who she's talking to. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, I mean, speaking of, well, I have, we have several things we wanted to ask about gender, but maybe I'll hold back one moment on that, though this is connected, because on that, when you were talking about the idea of um, people have said you're scraping off the barnacles or the, the idea that you're attacking... Yeah. And I think there is a certain element, um, even when it's in praise, <laughs> of that metaphor that suggests you're sort of attacking yeah. previous traditions of translation, right. that you're engaging directly with those traditions rather than, as you say, with the text. And then what results may yeah. or may not be the same as previous traditions. I have seen repeatedly this idea that your translation is somehow political or ideological in some way that previous translations have not been, usually right. tied to the fact because this is the first time a woman is translating it into English, therefore you, it yes. must be political and ideological. And in particular, in the way that, as we've been talking about, some of the sort of subaltern or, or marginalized figures are are more prominent than they sometimes are in other translations. And right. this is more a comment than a question in the traditional <laughs> conference, uh, because I simply want to register my... Uh, muffled fury, I suppose, is the, the term <laughs> yes. at that particular characterization because um, I don't see any way that any previous translation can be non, you know, if, if you bring to it no, I know. your approach. And I know you know this, but I just have to say it because it was irritating me so much every time I read it. Thank you for saying that. <laughs> every translation is political. Yes, duh. And every translation is ideological. And that's the idea that I'm the only person who has a gender because I'm female. Yes. Whereas all the other translation translators, you know, of course they didn't have to worry about gender because they were the white gender. Yeah. <laughs> and all, all of these things. <laughs> it's, it's absurd. Um, I and mean, I do think that that objection, I mean, if you can call it an objection, it tends to come up by people who haven't actually read my translation. Yes. yes. I mean, I think there was there was at least one review by somebody who clearly had not read the translation. <laughs> and I don't, I'm not going to you know, rant about it, but it's just, you know, that's just... I think then people get triggered. Mm-hmm. They, there are things where people have this notion that 
there may be these horrible people, people out there who are going to be irresponsible and destroy things that we should deeply love and value. Mm-hmm. And you know, once people have the notion that there might be something like that out there, then they can't pay attention anymore. Mm-hmm. And it's hard to have a reasoned discussion or and to invite people to, to say, to, just to think about it a little bit more. I don't have, I don't have very much to say about no. it. I, I think it's maybe not worth saying very much, but it's... Yeah, it's it definitely does come from people who haven't haven't read my translation. It definitely doesn't come from people time with it. Yeah, well, and I did I though I have actually seen if a less um, overt way of saying that, but something of the same thing coming even from those who are praising the translation very highly. Yeah nonetheless seem sometimes I think to uh, perhaps accidentally further that narrative that's you know finally we know, have someone yes. who is bringing correct ideology to the text. I know that's just that's a distortion. I wish they wouldn't do that it's not the way I see it at all yes and I mean I, I, I can sometimes the, these people are trying to be very nice mm-hmm. and I and I don't want to you know have an argument either with the people who are being nice or the people who aren't <laughs> no, but I, I do <laughs> But it, it, it doesn't really quite make sense. I mean, mm-hmm. none of it quite makes sense. You're quite right that, of course, each of these... Trans- translation is always it's always interpretative, it's always political in whatever ways. You know, the text is a political text. Mm-hmm. It's a text that's about social roles, it's a, it's a text that's about power and identity, and that's going to be the case, whatever literary style you use to, to translate it, mm-hmm. and whatever choices you make, um, either about simplifying or not simplifying, or foreignizing or not foreignizing. Mm-hmm. There's still going to be these issues are still going to be there. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that basically makes it sound as if translators in the past have not had to make any choices. They simply went with what was objectively correct. But now you're making a choice. They just have a translation. Yes. <laughs> I mean, I, I think I'm more conscious about my choices mm-hmm. and I'm more willing to talk about my choices than many translators have been. And in a way, that makes me vulnerable because mm-hmm. once I say I'm going to talk about my choices, then people notice, oh, you made choices. Mm-hmm. There must be something wrong with you. Mm-hmm. Uh, it didn't just come out of choices. heaven. <laughs> <laughs> yes. yeah. Yeah. No, exactly. Well, exactly. I think that is, in fact, you know, very much uh, a much larger question that what happens is when you're self-conscious and critical about one's own choices and aware, self-aware, by contrast, those who are completely unaware of their ideological leanings and utterly unself-critical can seem objective simply because they're unaware of, because they don't speak about their position. Mm-hmm. Yes, yeah. because they're blind to the fact they have a position. They then pretend that they don't have a position. Or people, can, people can even imagine that they don't have a position. Exactly. But of course everybody has a position. Yes. Mm-hmm. And that leads me to, you wrote um, something, and I went to look back to find it, and I could not find it again. But you wrote, uh, I read something just a few days ago about you talking about how people have expected you to identify with or love some of the female characters in particular in the poem, in particular at Penelope, and have wanted to create her in the image of a sort of modern kick-ass feminist kind of figure uh, and yeah. how that that is not perhaps the reading that you have of her. Right. Yes, that was in, I wrote a little piece for the New Yorker online. Um, That's right. Which where I started with that. Yes, yes, it's that piece. It turns out that searching for Emily Wilson Penelope feminist got me so many hits that I couldn't find <laughs> it anywhere. <either. laughs> I bet. Yes, yeah. It's funny. I mean, I, I I went through several drafts of that piece, and I I thought at first maybe, or at one stage maybe I'll start with this whole curveball about how it's not just that I identify with the female characters, or that I'm only interested in the female characters in mm-hmm. the poem. And again, I mean, I don't think that the male translators of this poem, of whom of course there have been many, were, were they constantly asked about? You must really identify with the male characters. <laughs> Look at you being male. <laughs> you must really identify with them. Um, Did you privilege yes. them over the women because you're so male? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> with your masculinist biases. Um, exactly. Yeah. I mean, I, I mean, I think I think the whole notion of wanting Penelope to be, um, you know, empowered female or proto-feminist, I mean, that that also speaks to the ways that the, the poem is more complicated than that. The mm-hmm. poem has has this, you know, ways of representing um, female characters as coming from these very, very different, I mean, there's a huge diversity in the female characters. The Penelope is very different, even from the other elite wives that we hear about in the poem, mm-hmm. from Helen and Clytemnestra. And she's also extremely different from both the goddess, goddess characters who are different from each other, 
and the slave characters, who again are different from each other. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think there's this notion that you you can just sort of lump all the females together, and the Odyssey itself, I think, resists that in a really interesting and powerful way. Mm-hmm. And I think it, and it just doesn't, to me, quite make sense to present Penelope as you know the, the happy, empowered wife and look how lovely it is that she and Odysseus are so smart so they have so much in common Mm -hmm. you know um and that 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 tend that reading tends to erase all the different ways that both um both her marriage disempowers her and also the narrative disempowers her Mm -hmm. she's constantly being deprived of information both about by Odysseus himself and by Athena there's this whole collusion to um make sure that Penelope doesn't um doesn't get to know what's going on until the absolute until, until it's more or less all over. Mm-hmm. And I mean, there, there are different theories in terms of um, how much does the Odyssey show an awareness of alternate traditions that there may have been alter, alter, alternative traditions about the Nostos of Odysseus, where Penelope and Odysseus may have worked together much more than they do mm-hmm. in this poem, in the poem we have. Um, but so it seems to me that the, that the Odyssey is making some really careful choices about how about the extent to which it disempowers Penelope. Mm-hmm. Um, and it, it's not like it had to do that because it was an archaic poem. Mm-hmm. You know, we see levels of agency or lack of agency being given to multiple different female characters. And I guess uh, just the, in, term, in terms of treating Penelope as a feminist icon, it seems to be really important that um, in that Mary Beard um Women in Power, she talks about one of the moments when Telemachus shuts up Penelope, mm-hmm. but she doesn't also talk about the moment when Penelope shuts up the slave woman mm-hmm. whom she's raised as her own daughter, shuts up Melantho, and then soon afterwards Melantho is presumably hanged. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So it's, it's really troubling um, representation whereby Penelope is not just a victim, she's also an oppressor. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And this is kind of a, a favorite topic for me, the, the idea of looking for, for women, quote unquote, heroes. And I kind of put scare quotes around that because there is the danger of projecting from our modern sensibilities um, and looking for women who act like male heroes. And perhaps yeah. there is a need to to rethink this and come up with a, a radically different female heroism, which is sensitive to the constraints and the, the cultural uh, world in which women live in the ancient world. And, you know, this mm-hmm. is a kind of a reimagining uh, that has, had already been going on since the ancient world. We have, you know, Ovid writing, you know, from the female, the, mm-hmm. the perspective of female characters, and Chaucer does the same. But th- recently there is yeah. a kind of spate of novels reimagining. So the, the, my, the favorite that comes to my mind is the Penelope ad by Margaret Atwood, mm-hmm. which yeah, tries to look that. at yes. it from that perspective. But what she doesn't do... Yes is make Penelope an equivalent hero. No, she doesn't doesn't give her male heroism. Yeah, um, exactly. In a way that I think would be very contrary to Mm -hmm. anything in the textual sources. And it does present her as both the oppressed and the oppressor. Mm -hmm. Yes, it does. It it brings that out very well. It's one of the things I like most about that, about the Penelope ad, is is the way that she she deals with the the murdered slaves Mm -hmm. very, very powerfully. Mm Mm-hmm. I mean, I guess if we're looking for a female agency, then Helen is a much better place to mm-hmm, go yeah. than Penelope because she gets to move around. Unlike other, you know, mortal females, she she's you know she's been to Troy and back, and mm-hmm. in there are certain ways that her her art and her abilities are more much more parallel to Odysseus's in certain ways that she's able to to lie and disguise herself and be in control of narrative mm-hmm. in ways that Penelope and that she's maybe Penelope would be. She, she, the, the narratives that Penelope is in control of are her own dreams, as opposed to these big narratives about Troy and the heroes there. Yeah, and uh, she she isn't able to control the singer who tells the stories of Troy. She isn't able to stop him mm. from singing them. Yes. If we think in metaphor, uh, a metaphor that's definitely activated within both the Iliad and the Odyssey of weaving as storytelling, her only control is in undoing her storytelling, Mm -hmm. undoing her weaving, as opposed to Helen with her weaving her own story in the Iliad. Exactly. So so Helen's art is representational and she actually... She She finishes it, presumably. She finishes it, presumably, and it's... It's retellable and it and it speaks to the same world of discourse as the world of men. Mm-hmm. Whereas Penelope's, we don't ever know is it representational at all. It, it's never finished, so it, it's its only purpose is to try to delay time. Mm-hmm. And even that, it can't do. Mm-hmm. She's forced to finish because 
she can't actually hold back time forever. I think there's this real tension going on in the poem about Odysseus's desire to um, be in control of time and make make it as if 20 years never existed. Mm-hmm. And he's the exact same person, the same identity as always. Mm-hmm. Whereas and Penelope is, in, in a way, grasping for that, but she's aware that that can never happen, mm-hmm. that she's going to be forced to finish her work, that she can't delay time forever. She, her face is marked, her bed is marked, that there are stains that don't come out. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that conf- contrast between Odysseus, whose youth is brought back to him by Athena, who gets to sort of, as it yes. were, not age, in spite of the, the disguise of age, and the contrast between him and then the, the, the beard on Telemachus that so forcibly marks the fact that he's that there has been 20 years, and then and then poor old Argus yes. dying. I think those are my two moments yes. of, of you know really heightening that, mm-hmm. enforcing yes. that temporal change has happened. The dog, that is, yes. for those who are listening and don't remember who no. Argus is. <laughs> 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 it's a beautiful moment in the phone. Yes. Heartbreaking. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I think I, I have many thoughts on, but I I, we, I don't think we this is the time or place to expand on them. But on, on the understandable impulse to look for uh, sort of feminist role models in the ancient world and to try to find people who weren't disempowered the way we would feel we were disempowered were we in that world. <laughs> if that isn't too yes. convoluted, a way of putting it. Yeah. Um, yeah. But I, I don't, and it's fine if you're doing rewriting a fiction or whatever, but trying to see those people in the texts, it does a disservice to them by sort of betraying the kind of restrictions and constraints that were on them. And to imagine a world in which, you know, an exceptional woman could just be completely different than all the other women. And it's, it's, it's not, you know, thousands of years of women didn't get to live that life. And to imagine them as doing so to satisfy us is sort of a betrayal of what they did live. Yes, I agree with that. And I actually think in a way, you know, this is, sort of a leap but the whole me too movement and the Mm -hmm. movement towards we're going to acknowledge the ways that you know women have been disempowered and abused and there are terrible terrible constraints sometimes put on Mm -hmm. women and other kinds of subalterns and we have to we have to acknowledge that before we can do anything else yes exactly Um, and that goes back the last 40 years but also the last four millennia either way um try our best to see the truth of the context first and then look for what does heroism mean within that context if we're looking for heroism Mm -hmm. yes well we've kept you for quite a while so i think maybe we can stop there for those who are listening i hope that has wet your appetite as it should be if you have not read the uh the translation yet um i mean we both in case that wasn't clear, we both very much enjoyed <laughs> the translation. Um, I am in. Thank you. I don't know whether I'm going to. I'm now very much regretting the fact that I don't know that I'm going to have an opportunity to teach with it anytime soon because I don't teach the. I teach Roman epic, teaching at this term, but I don't teach oh. the Greek Greek epic course at our in our class. But I may have to find some way of getting it on the curriculum. I have a possible plan for that. You have a plan? Oh, <laughs> yes. yeah, that's true. We have our yes, women in epic possible <laughs> plan in the long run. Because I do, but I will definitely be bringing it to my colleague's attention for his next time that he teaches it. Because I think I, quite apart from all the other things we've we've discussed, I think it really is beautifully functional as an attractive, engaging text. And your introduction and your preface, you know, translator's note are exemplary in terms of getting the stuff you want to get across to the students as background. So it is going to be very useful from that perspective. Thank you. I hope so. Well, it's lovely to talk to you. Thank you so much for the really great conversation. Thank you. Well, yeah, we appreciate you taking the time. And it, it's it's nice to be able to get into sort of lo- a little bit longer discussions mm-hmm. about some of these elements. Um, the task of translation is such an endearingly fascinating mm-hmm. one of trying to figure out how to do that. So thank you very much. And we'll be back with our next um, series of podcast episodes, which are going to be the selections from the interviews we've had on race and racism within classics and the medieval disciplines. That should be at least two episodes, and those are going to be the next ones out. So we'll see you then. Bye-bye. Bye. For more information on this podcast, check out our website, www.alliterative.net, where you can find links to the videos, blog posts, sources, and credits, and all our contact info. And please check out our Patreon, where you can pledge to support this show and our video project. You can go directly to the videos at youtube.com slash alliterative. Our email is on the website, but the easiest way to get in touch with us is Twitter. I'm at Avensarah, A-V-E-N-S-A-R-A-H. 
and I'm at Alliterative. To keep up with the podcast, subscribe on your favourite podcast app or to the feed on the website. And if you've enjoyed it, consider leaving us a review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen. It helps us a lot. We'll be back soon with more musings about the connections around us. Thanks for listening. Bye.